Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Caitlin Sonnen from the Managed Care Technical Assistance Center, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's Medicaid Managed Care Billing Panel. Before we get started, I'm going to run through just a few logistics. Please chat in your questions throughout the webinar. We are planning to have a significant amount of time to answer as many questions as we can, but please send them into the chat at any point throughout the webinar today. If you cannot see the chat yet, if you hover over the bottom toolbar and click the thought bubble, that will make the chat appear. Please be sure to chat your questions into all panelists so we can all see them. Um, we encourage you to send questions that can be answered across the plan versus questions that are for one specific plan. If you have a nuanced question for one specific plan, then we recommend that you follow up with them specifically. And there will be contact information shared during this webinar, and there's also always the matrix which has contact information for each Medicaid managed care plan. So in addition, when we chat in your questions, if they are in reference to a specific service or program, please be sure to let us know. That way our panelists can give you the most accurate, informed answer. Um, a couple other logistical things. We will be recording this webinar and the recording and the slides it will be posted to our website. So you will be able to find them. Um, this is the last of these three webinars is this recording and Slides will be posted very soon. And you'll be able to access them, any of the links or contact information that's in them. And finally, we do have all of our panelists on camera today. We encourage you to change the layout to a grid view. So if you hover at the top, you can see the layout and put a grid view on, and that way you can more closely resemble it as if it was an in person panel. And with that, I'm going to run through our agenda for this afternoon. So we're going to start with a review of the three billing and RCM tools that we released last summer, and then we will turn it over to the plan panel. So each plan panelist will introduce themselves and go through a brief presentation with some general billing information, contact resources, et cetera. And then we will go on to the common questions, and each plan will answer those. And then we'll open up to Q&A. So as I said before, please submit your questions. We'd also like to thank everyone who submitted their questions when they registered via the survey. Um, we will go through as many questions as we can. And if your question is not addressed, you can, or if you have another question after this, then of course you can use the same contact information that will be shown at the end. All right, so to review our slides, our tool. So we've got the top denial tool. So this tool is one of the three that were released last summer. And what this tool does is it lays out top denial reasons to code um, and what you can do to fix that. So if you're getting a code back and you're not sure what it means, this might be a helpful resource for you to figure that out. And then to figure out if there's any nuances for a particular plan, that's the last column. We also have the RCM best practices tool. So this lays out the different periods across the service prior to service, during the service, after the service, elements that should be undertaken, and best practices or tips for how to keep them. And then the last column shows how this can interact with the billing fields on the claim form, as well as potential denial codes if there's an issue with one of these steps. And then finally, we have our billing and RCM best practices tip sheet. So this is the one pager that you can print out um, to keep in front of you and just sort of keep these key guidelines in mind as you're going through the process. We do intend for these three tools to be used in conjunction with each other, as well as with the matrix, which has contact information for each plan whose communication is so key, and our billing tool, which is the interactive DB04 tool. Okay. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary from Blue Cross Blue Shield, Western New York. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mary Ferber. Are you ready? Okay. My name is Mary Ferber, and I'm a, I'm a network relations consultant manager. Um, I work for Amerigroup. Um, just very quickly, Amerigroup partners with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Western New York to administer the Medicaid Managed Care and Child Health Plus programs. So everything that we're going to talk about today is related to the Medicaid um, and Child Health Plus programs. So um, thank you all for coming. Appreciate your time. Know that everybody's very busy. Um, I hope um, many of you recognize me or recognize my voice um, and working together over the phone. 
um, and that we have had a chance to work together. Um, I, I, our presentation today will be just kind of a high level overview and uh, just a few slides. Um, and then um, as Caitlin mentioned, there'll be time for question and answers in a little bit. Uh, but wanted to put together just some key pointers from your billing team's perspective that um, I thought would be helpful. So just starting off, here is a billing quick reference um, slide. And it's sort of a one-stop shopping for important timeframes to know for different um, types of situations. So um, filing claims, um, we follow a 120-day timely filing rule which I know that there's some variation across the plans, so we kind of fall in the middle, I think, um, in, in those timeframes. Um, I know that the state follows a 90 day, so I would recommend folks to really try to get their claims in within 90 days is probably a best practice. Um, payment disputes, if you're finding that you um, wanna challenge uh, the outcome of a payment, we'd like you to hear from you within 45 calendar days from the receipt of your explanation of payment. Um, corrected claim, get your, your corrected claims to us right away, uh, but within 90 days of the filing resubmission period. And then medical appeals, um, I added that here just because um, it's important information to know. Um, so we want to ensure that you're contacting us within uh, 90 calendar days of the date of notice of action. Um, our provider manual, and I'm gonna show you in, in just a, a minute, um, sort of the, the landing page for our um, provider website, but you can get to our provider manual from the website and chapter 13 is the soup to nuts in claims. So I think that that's a really important chapter to overview um, besides the behavioral health uh, section of the manual. Um, so I, you know, I would recommend that you take the time um, put a little shortcut, you know, to that section um, for your references so that you have that handy. Um, we do uh, work with Availity. So I'm sure folks are familiar with Availity. If you're not, sign up to Availity.com. We'll get into a little bit more of that later. And then here's some important phone numbers. Um, our provider call center, the Availity call center, and then the ED EDI solutions help desk. So next slide. So this is the uh, landing page for our provider site. And I'm bringing this to your attention only because we have had a change uh, in our provider website. If you go to the old URL, you'll still um, be redirected to this site. Uh, but you know we're sort of proud because um, our provider website now has a public area that you don't need to log in through Availity to get through. And I think that that was kind of a barrier to quickly to be able to get to information uh, related to our plan. So on this, you know, this landing page here can get you to um, our resources and you can see there, I've kind of, it's toggled down to where you can get the provider manual. There's information on claims, patient care, eligibility, communications, which is where we're posting for our quarterly provider newsletter, and then also any other targeted updates uh, that we're sending out. So, um, you know, go to the website, look around. It doesn't take too long to get through all of this, but it's really important, I think, that you have that and you know how to find it. Um, next slide. So, Availity. Availity is the um, organization that we work with that offers um, tools that are helpful for you for billing. Availity is a secure portal and you need to sign up. You need to have um, uh, an account um, and password. And then once you sign up to avail up for Availity, uh, there's, there's different kinds of um, um, sort of program offerings that you can take advantage of. Um, that suit your business need. So let's say that you want to, um, Availity is our EDI vendor, so you want to sign up uh, with Availity for electronic billing. Um, we also offer individual claim submissions, so they have a tool there where you can, if you're not gonna actually um, you know, do the EDI option, that you can key in a claim uh, using their tool, so that's really helpful. Um, you can get claim status, um, eligibility, member eligibility, you know, uh, which uh, are they enrolled with the plan and what's, what are their eligibility dates. 
Um, and then electronic funds transfer and remittance advice. So um, just some of the other things that we offer there that, you know, make it um, and help it that it's efficient for you um, to do your day to day, you know, working with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Western New York. Next slide. So um, I just decided to add Patient 360 here. Patient 360 is a tool through Availity, and it it provides the opportunity to um, for your for case management offered through your organization to um, get a little bit uh, more information related to a member's care experience. So again, this is really kind of targeted more towards uh, your case management. Uh, teams, but if you are um, looking for additional information related to a specific member and the care that they're obtaining, you can find that here. Um, and it's something that we can provide training on as well. So if you're interested, you can certainly reach out. Um, next slide. And authorization and pre certification, always a really popular topic. Um, I think that we just, you know, you can't put everything you'd want someone to know about authorization here. There's a section in the manual for on authorizations. You want to take a look at that. We do have a grid in the manual that outlines the different services and whether pre-auth is required or notification is required. I think for today we're talking about uh, with outpatient providers, uh, but many of you might have um, maybe pros or act programs. Um, children's HCBS programs that require authorization. Uh, and so, you know, you, you want to be able to um, find the information on our plan related to authorizations, and that would be within our provider manual. Um, and then just some additional information about um, whether you can use our lookup tool to find out if a particular service requires authorization and where to call for help. So next slide. I'm not sure if we have another one or not. Yes, key contact information. So uh, keep these phone numbers handy. You'll see that um, we have one phone number for just about everything. <laughs> so, so we have um, our member provider services. So that team will direct you to where you need to go. Um, I know many of you have my contact information, but you can see it's listed there. Um, and so um, I know, you know, you want to make use of the service departments. They're great for checking on claim status. If you're not going to, you know, take the option to do an unavailability or to get a quick answer to a question. But folks do reach out to me, you know, when they find that some of our other routes um, are not successful. And I'd welcome you to do that. And then also have the paper claim submission, um, you know, address there if you need that. So. Um, thanks for the opportunity to talk about our plan today, and I guess we'll um, pass it to the next plan. Thank you, Mary. And now I will turn it over to Pam from Fidelis Care. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is Pam Keo from Fidelis, and I am one of the Provider Relations Behavioral Health Specialists. There's four of us across the state. Um, and I am in the Western region, actually covering Buffalo, Rochester, and the Eastern half of the Syracuse region. Um, so I'm very grateful to be here today and I'm looking forward to this. Next slide. So um, as I'm sure the other plans uh, we'll talk about, we have so many resources and um, you can find these at our website, fideliscare.org. Um, our provider manual is on that website. You'll find it there. Um, and I know manuals can be overwhelming. There's a wealth of information. So we just wanted to pull out a few of these sections to point them out. Um, the section 12, part one is on claim submission. There's a part two of that section that has to do with billing guidelines. So very important information in there. We have a dedicated section just to the behavioral health um, services. And then section 24 is specific to the Healthier Life, which is our HARP program, the Health and Recovery Plan program. And then section 25 um, is dedicated to our Medicaid Children's Expanded Benefits. This would be the Children and Family Treatment Support Services, CFTSS, um, and the Children's Home and Community-Based Services. On our website, you will also find authorization requirements. There's a grid there. It's very detailed, um, really helpful. If you um, scroll down, you will find the section on behavioral health 
and all of the coding uh, requirements, I'm sorry, the authorization requirements are found there. Um, on our website, you will also find provider tip sheets. Um, I have to say, I'm very um, excited about these tip sheets and providers seem to really appreciate them. Um, and there's a link there that you'll see. Um, we have a coding tip sheet specific to the BH HTBS, which are the adult HTBS services, it's coding and billing, um, as well as the children's services, the CFTSS and HTBS. And what we've done is taking the state uh, coding specifications and put those um, in nice grids on the tip sheets. Uh, there's also help, helpful bullets there, uh, the rev code you wanna bill with, um, a reminder that you can only bill one rate code per claim tips like that. Um, the other important sections that we've included are allowable service uh, combinations. So if you haven't um, seen any of those or haven't obtained any of those tip sheets, I really encourage you to click on there. Also tip sheets on EDI and things like that. So very helpful. Next slide, please. Our provider portal, we call provider access online. Um, this is an enhanced provider portal, and it's really critical part of our effort to increase efficiency and expand services to our per participating providers. Um, I have to say providers really um, have given us great feedback on our portal. I think um, it, they really like it. It's easy um, to access. Um, so the advantages of using the portal um, things that the, some of the functionality is that you can view and um, view member eligibility, coverage, benefits. Um, you can check on claim status, review history. Um, you can view authorizations as well as on um, request authorizations for inpatient and most of the outpatient BH services. You can download your remittance advice from the portal, um, search for our participating providers within our network, and then we also post um, important information announcements that you wanna make sure that you uh, see. So all of that and more on our portal. You can also access a user guide from the portal and that's how to request online authorization and then checking your auth status and that, that'll walk you through that, that process. Um, if you haven't already registered for the portal, I um, would really encourage that and you can do that by calling our provider call center the number is there, or you can uh, work with your provider relations representative. Next slide, please. Uh, electronic submission of claims. Um, I think we can all agree that it's very advantageous to submit claims electronically. It's faster processing and reimbursement of those clean claims. Uh, you can reduce or eliminate the number of claims not being received. I mean, when you're sending things through the mail, especially nowadays, um, it's a risk, and if you do send through the mail, certainly want to encourage you to send those certified. Um, and the, um, the other advantage is just proof of timely submission uh, through your electronic acceptance reports. Um, our preferred clearinghouse for electronic claim submission is Availity, um, and to enroll, is simply there's a phone number there, and um, you can en enroll that way. A claim can also be submitting through the Clearinghouse Ability. Uh, Fidelis Care offers free online claim submission through Ability's claim portal. So here's where you would key in your claim. And again, free is a good word. Um, and so to learn more about ability, uh, ability or to register, I've got the phone number and the link there for you. And you, you also, of course, have the option of, an, of submitting claims through other clearinghouses. Um, and you just have to make sure that they will afford those to Fidel's care on your behalf. Next slide, please. Um, lastly, just wanted to uh, include this slide um, for our behavioral health department. We have the phone numbers, extension, fax number, and the email address. We do have these cues and, and information separated by um, services, and I think that's helpful. Uh, for the BHQ, um, there's the information, phone, fax, and email. Um, there's a separate queue for HARP, um, and then one for the children queue. Um, and then for the phone extensions, we have those listed there. I think what's um, nothing more frustrating than when you call in and you get bounced around from 
um, extension to extension. So um, this should be helpful in getting you direct access to those specific departments for uh, the type of members that you have. Okay, so with that said, thank you so much. Thank you, Pam. And now I will turn it over to Cheryl and we can help. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining the call. My name is Cheryl Foley. I'm the Director of Provider Relations at Beacon Health Options for New York. I'm sure either myself or a member of my team have had the opportunity to speak with many of you over the course of the past year or so. So welcome. I'm very happy that you could all attend. Beacon Health Options, as you may know, is a behavioral health company who works with um, our plans to administer behavioral health benefits for members of those plans. And for the purposes of this meeting, it is for uh, their Medicaid populations. Um, on this slide, uh, this is uh, simply an, our New York map, which shows a quick overview of where each of the Medicaid plans we work with are located and where their population, I'm sorry, where their Medicaid populations reside. On the next slide, this is a resource for your use when submitting claims to Beacon. This can be shared with your billing teams, your clearing houses, and your revenue cycle management teams. For each of the plans we work with, we have listed out the different means by which you can submit the claims. Across the columns, you'll see each of the options for submitting claims. If you submit through one of our portals, the information is listed depending on the plan. There's also information on whether you can submit individual claims or batch claims. We've also included our payer ID, depending on the plan, as well as a claims mailing address for paper claims. Again, you can keep this as a resource to share with your billing teams. On the next slide, this is simply a screenshot of the front page of our website at beaconhealthoptions.com. There are many resources available to you on our website. You can go into our portals from this page, which allows you to review eligibility, submit claims, etc. It also has guidance on how to become a provider with Beacon, as well as other features such as the ability to review the provider handbook and reviewing specific plan information and how to contact Beacon depending on your questions. When you access your website, you'll also see uh, the red banner where providers can click for the latest information on COVID updates, which includes information on state billing guidelines, as well as cost share waivers, et cetera. There's a lot of state specific information on this site and we certainly invite you to review that information at your convenience. And our final slide, this is simply a resource which uh, gives you links to several of our pages. Um, and it includes our National Provider Service Line phone number, which is available from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. Um, that is it for Beacon. Again, I want to thank you for attending and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you, Cheryl. And now I will turn it over to Sarah from Excellus. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. We're so excited to be able to share information with you all today. Um, so I'd like to give a little bit of a background on Excellus. And before we get started, um, just note that um, we also help support Univera Healthcare. So both Excellus and Univera Healthcare are under the Lifetime Healthcare um, company. So my name is Sarah Newsom. I am a children's behavioral health provider relations rep, and I also help support those HCBS providers um, for adult services as well. Um, on the next slide, we're gonna go over the health plan overview. And within, within this overview, we've got the Excellus provider portal, and a lot of the other plans have talked about their portals. And this is a great way to check membership and eligibility, check uh, benefits, understand where the claim is and if the claim status, check a claim adjustment, um, if there is a service that requires prior authorization, as well as the provider manual. And if you ever want a walkthrough of the provider portal, always feel free to reach out and we would be happy to do a training um, and an overview of that. Um, within Excellus, we also 
accept both electronic and paper claim submissions. And if you do have questions, um, always feel free to reach out to your provider relations rep and we can walk through that. We offer provider training. This is a great opportunity for our in-network providers to receive training um, from both either a provider relations representative and or um, from our clinical training team. And on our provider portal, it walks through all of the different trainings that we offer. Um, so we always encourage providers to look up that information. And if you are interested in a specific training, um, feel free to register or reach out to your uh, provider relations representative. At Excellus, we also have an internal case management team. And this team really helps to ensure that members are receiving all of the necessary services um, to their care. So for, from both a physical health and a behavioral health standpoint, um, so if you're working with an individual and they've, they're experiencing specific barriers in their care, always feel free to reach out because we wanna be able to bridge any of those gaps. Um, and on the screen, you'll see a, a picture, and this is just a snip as to how you can register for the Excellus Provider Portal. Um, if you do have specific questions, like I said, always feel free to reach out to your provider relations rep and we can walk through that with you. Um, on the next slide, we're gonna talk about who our team is um, for the Behavioral Health Provider Relations um, representative. So the first individual identified here is Jennifer DeMars and she's our manager of Behavioral Health Provider Relations. She is located in our CNY area and all of her contact information is on the screen. And then we have uh, Michelle Scott and she helps to support um, our areas of solo and group providers, OMH and OASIS licensed facilities, and then her areas of coverage are identified um, on the screen as well as her contact information. Um, Brian Federley, um, as you can see, he covers a wide range um, of areas and his contact information as well as areas of expertise where he helps to support providers is identified on on the screen as well. And then my contact information is on the bottom, um, as well as the areas where I help to uh, support. So we love to hear from our providers, always feel free to reach out. And our last slide today is the contact information. So who can you contact if you have questions um, just around the health plan or need to get in contact with someone specifically? Um, this is a great resource to have. Um, all of this information did come from the MCTAC uh, plan matrix. So we wanted to make sure that everything was the same, but this really kind of identifies all of your key contacts right here. So if you have to get in touch with someone from um, our EDI department, um, contracting, case management, um, you can always, like I said, if you're trying to get in touch with someone specifically, feel free to reach out to your provider relations um, representative. So we are excited again to be here today and we look forward to talking to you when um, you have questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. And now I will turn it over to our last plan panelist, Heidi from United. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming. My name is Heidi Hopkins, and I'm the New York Network Liaison for New York State. Next slide, please. So I'm just going to go through some high-level overview of claim submission and a few other things. So first off, we'll start with claim submission. Um, just noting here our payer ID that you would submit to electronically. However, if you have to submit via paper, our address is down below, the Salt Lake City, Utah address, and make sure to submit on an original UBO4 form, um, no photocopies, please, and make sure the information is in there legibly and all fields are completed. Next slide, please. Next slide, oh, there we go, sorry, I'm just catching up here. I guess I'm, my computer might be a little slow. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're submitting a clean claim form. So as you can see here, so here are some of the fields that you really wanna make sure you have the correct information in there, especially you know, your mem the member information, their name, their Medicaid ID number and date of birth to help us identify who that member is, who we have to process the claim for. Um, also, you know, your provider information and, you know, 
value codes and rate codes, your rev codes, CPT codes, data service. Um, Want to make sure all of that information is filled, filled out and legible if it's on a paper claim. Next slide, please. And a few quick reminders are, you know, make sure you verify that eligibility prior to rendering the service. Also, um, I know we get a lot of questions and stuff on authorization, so make sure you're obtaining that prior authorization for the services that require it. Um, make sure the proper value code and rate code combination is put in place. Um, remember, only one rate code per claim. And again, your you know CPTs, uh, modifiers, units should all be on the claim form. Again, the tax ID reminder. And finally, review provider remittance advice regularly to identify issues early in case you need to submit um, an appeal to us, which brings us to our next slide. So in order to submit a PL, it would need to be sent um, via mail and it'd be needed to be in within 60 days of receipt of that provider remittance advice. And below here, you'll see the address in Salt Lake City, Utah that the appeal should be sent to. And this um, slide deck will be made available so you will have that information. And I'll also be showing you um, on a couple slides later some different uh, websites that we have that you can access this information as well. Next slide, please. Um, next, we're going to talk about our PAN system. It is the Prior Authorization and Notification System. This is a web-based system that you can log on to and submit your authorizations and notifications. We do offer a training on this, so if you're interested and have not used this yet, please reach out to one of the contacts on the last page of this slide or myself, and I can get you set up with our trainer so that you can get a training on how to use that system. But also, we still offer um, the telephonic. Um, you can call in and get that off, your services authorized as well. Next slide, please. And as I stated a couple of slides ago, um, we do have some online resources available. We have our UHCprovider.com where you can check your member eligibility, um, claim status. There's a bunch of tools and resources available on that site. Um, ProviderExpress.com. There is a specific page dedicated to New York. Um, you will find very helpful information there for um, both the adults and the under 21 population. Um, that site also houses information on the PAN system that I was just talking about. Our network manual is there. There are some pre-recorded trainings and resources available as well. Um, so that site is one of our most used sites, I would say. Um, the UHCCommunityPlan.com, that's a website for the healthcare professional community and organizations and members, and it will direct you to our secure provider site, United Healthcare Online. Live and Work Well, that is our um, search engine. It's the site where you would go to search for in-network providers. Next slide, please. And finally, this is the contact information for the network managers that are in your area. Um, as you can see, there's Karen and Kelsey. And feel free to reach out to me with any questions you may have as well. But we also have a general mailbox that you can reach out to at the New York Network Management at Optum.com. Thank you. Thank you, Heidi. And thank you to all of our panelists for their brief presentation. Now I'm going to turn it over to Gore Bill Gorin with Nick Talks, who's going to be the moderator for the question section of our panel today. All right. Uh, thank you, Caitlin, and thank you all to all the panelists for this uh, great uh, overview and, and presentation. Just again, a, a quick reminder, especially for folks who might have joined us a little later. Uh, one is we are uh, recording uh, today's uh, discussion and presentation, and we'll make that this recording available on the MCTAC website, where, and also slides will be made available as well. Um, also wanted to continue to encourage folks to chat in their questions. Uh, today's presentation is really meant for you to be able to ask our, our panelists uh, the questions you have around billing. We are trying as hard as possible to make uh, questions relevant for all of the plans and, and you know, um, as, as you kind of build. So again, you know, even if you have a specific question to a plan, we might uh, generalize it because we want to have an opportunity for uh, all the plans to answer questions. Um, and I think as Caitlin talked uh, uh, 
you know, early on during the agenda. Um, we kind of have three areas of questions uh, that we want to go through. First, we'll go through some, you know, three common questions that uh, we get a lot um, or want the plans to talk about. We also want to say thank you to folks who submitted questions ahead of today's presentation and want to get to those questions as well. And then, of course, we'll open the discussion to all the questions that are, are coming in through the chat. Again, we'll try to get to uh, as many as possible uh, today. Um, but, and I appreciate everybody's uh, participation. So um, let's start with our, our common questions. And, you know, the first question really wanted to turn to our panelists and the plans um, to really talk a little bit about the most common denial reasons uh, that they're seeing uh, within each of their plans and maybe give us some tips on how some of these denials could be addressed um, or resolved. Um, so let's start with uh, Mary. Um, maybe you can talk a little bit about the common denial reasons. Sure. So the most common denial, uh, common denial reasons that we see are duplicate claims, a member has no coverage, and no authorizations. So what can you do to help avoid those? Um, for duplicate claims, um, and just sort of looking at claims overall for providers and how they bill, Providers will bill one week and then they'll bill again and then they'll bill again and they're electronic billing their whole file. So it may be that you have received payment for a claim by the time that next bill comes in and it's going to um, deny duplicate. So I guess it would be, um, you know, just to uh, review your receipts and ensure that those receipts are booked effectively before you're billing again. That will save you some time on your end member has no coverage you'll want to check um, the resources available you know we have um, um, you can check e-paces or you can check um, on our website we have a tool where you can check member eligibility ensure that they are eligible and authorizations ensure that uh, you have your authorizations in timely um, ensure that your claims um, the dates uh, for what you're billing for match the authorization in the units. I think that that's the two of the big things um, that we have. Uh, one other thing that I'll just also say is um, I think folks end up contacting us for the non-common denial reasons. And I'll call out a couple. Uh, one is related to a benefit limit. And I think that that's important, especially for the HCBS, CFTSS, um, you know, we as plans are supposed to have a soft limit, um, and so we need to be able to work with you and have a conversation if it looks like cases are going to be going above the limit. So, so uh, don't be shy to reach out um, to let us know that um, you're going to be seeing that. And then also related to modifiers, um, I think that we've kind of cleared through um, some of the modifier denials that you are seeing from our plan. Um, but we, you know, implemented a clinical edit related to telehealth and those modifiers in the state released lots of guidance related to that. And so we wanted to put some edits in place just to be able to track that and to make sure that there's some consistency and folks were questioning that. So when you when you do see a denial related to that, make sure you reach out um, to me and uh, we can have a conversation around around that. So um, so thank you. Great, thank you, Mary. Let's let's go to Pam. Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, one of the common denial reasons we see are for timely filing. Um, so I just want to mention several things within that. Um, for Fidelis, initial claims uh, should be submitted to Fidelis uh, within 90 days or the time frame specified in your contract. Um, so also for corrected claims, um, if you're submitting a corrected claim. Um, I think what happens sometimes is that it's not coded appropriately for a corrected claim. Um, and so it comes in like an initial claim and will deny timely filing. So it's important to remember that that type of bill, the frequency code, that last digit has to be a seven. And that you also reference the claim, the original claim number that you are correcting. Um, so that's really, really important. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that uh, there's uh, EDI rejection sometimes can impact us. 
Um, these are rejections, they're not denials. And so you have to be really um, diligent about checking your EDI rejection reports, your reject accept reports. Um, sometimes we'll have providers that will contact us uh, several months down the road and say, hey, where's my claim? And we don't have it on file. It never made it to Fidelis. Um, so really, again, want to stress the importance of reviewing those reports. If you're not getting them, you should be. Uh, so check with your clearinghouse on those. The other uh, common denial reason we'll see is uh, related to provider billing errors. Um, invalid rate and procedure code combo, as well as rate code inconsistent with units. And again, very um, uh, be very careful and diligent about referring to the state's guidance on that. Again, we have tip sheets for that. Um, make sure that you're using the appropriate uh, rate code with the CPT code and the check the modifier and unit. Um, so those are very specific. Um, even for the CFTSS, we have the primary service and then that off-site claim. Those share, uh, most times we'll share the common uh, CPT code um, and usually just the difference is a modifier or so and then it has its own unique rate code, of course. So it's a lot of coding specification, specifications and you just have to, you know, use your resources from the state as well as Fidelis and, and um, pay attention to those combinations. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you, Pam. Thank you. Um, Sarah, let's go to you now for this question on common denials. Okay, awesome. Uh, thank you. So the three common denial reasons that we see at Excellus are member eligibility. So maybe the subscriber ID has terms um, and the it's not the most up-to-date subscriber ID. Um, so we always encourage providers to check membership eligibility, um, or maybe the member's coverage was not in effect at the date of services. Um, the other one is no authorization on file. So we encourage providers um, to check which services they're rendering and if they are on our prior authorization list. Um, and if you do have any questions about that, always feel free to reach out to your provider relations rep and we can help you with that. Um, lastly is the duplicate claims. So um, it's the same member, same date of service. Um, and again, I think um, both Pam and Mary kind of spoke to this a little bit. So when you, if you need to send an adjustment, um, just making sure that you update that frequency code. Um, and if you have any questions, you can always reach out. Thank you. Great, thank you. Heidi, I think we'll go to you next. Sure. So it seems we're seeing a common theme here for all the denials across all of our organizations. So I'm going to go ahead and tell you the same thing. So for um, us, we see a lot of eligibility denials. So, you know, make sure you're verifying that eligibility prior to billing to us. And I know sometimes we see that eligibility wasn't termed and you had already seen the member and billed us the claim. So sometimes there's those retro updates. Um, also, we see a lot of the no authorization. So just make sure, you know, the services that are requiring that authorization, you're getting that authorization and making sure it matches what you're billing for. Um, and thirdly, I would say are the billing coding combinations. I know, um, you know, ever since the um, children's implementation and a lot of the CFTSS services, um, went live, we, we have seen more of those um, based upon those modifiers, rate code, and CPT HICPIC combinations. Um, so it, it is, and it can be a little bit confusing sometimes um, to build those services. So just make sure that you're, you know, refilling, referring back to that provider billing manual. The children's manual has a lot of great information and a lot of charts in there that will show you exactly how to bill for those services. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, Cheryl? Thank you. So for Beacon, um, again, the most common denial reasons that we're showing is no authorization, especially for diversionary services, uh, such as PROS Act, uh, partial hospital. Um, and a lot of times you'll see where uh, the number of visits uh, that had previously been approved or the time frame approved is expired. Um, so please ensure that the authorizations are on file or in many cases extended uh, to cover the dates of service and the services you're rendering prior to billing for the services. Um, the second reason that we find uh, is most common is non-covered services. 
And this is commonly due to providers billing um, with invalid modifiers or combinations of modifiers. For example, if you have a pro service where you're billing typically, um, you know, non telehealth, you're billing an H2019 U2. Uh, we've seen a lot of circumstances where the U2 is dropped um, accidentally and it's just being billed as an H2019 GT. So since there is no real code um, for H2019, uh, the service would deny as a non covered service. Um, to help you guys with those denials of uh, provider billing errors, whatever the issue may be, uh, certainly visit our website to review and register for any number of our provider focused training webinars that would help you with those uh, claim denials and most common reasons. Thank Excellent. Thank you, Cheryl. So um, thank you for uh, running down the kind of the common denials. And I know one of the things, and I think all of you, uh, or some of you touched on this is, is authorization. Cheryl was just talking about authorization as well is one of the reasons, but there's also notifications. And and I know, you know, we talked again a, a, a little bit already about authorizations. Um, you know, I just want to give another chance. If Is there anything specific to notifications as well that you guys want to mention? And uh, let's go with Cheryl again. Sure, so, so that was the second question where, uh, what was the most important thing to remember regarding notification or authorization? And from the beacon standpoint, I think the most important thing to remember is which services require that notification of admission, such as um, inpatient admissions, um, and, and also what type of service, whether it's an OASIS service, uh, adults, um, whether it's crisis for children, um, and and what the age groups are in the services that actually require the notification of admission versus those that re require an actual authorization, such as diversionary services. Um, and also to just please make sure that those authorizations are on file before you actually do any bill for those services. Excellent. Thank you. Sarah, yes, sir. let's go to you next. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so, um, on our website, we do have that authorization list and it will outline what services require notification and what services require authorization. So I guess just kind of high level, um, adult HCBS, they require authorization, the children's services, so CFTSS, um, they require notification, um, children's HCBS, there's only a few services that do require authorization, but the majority um, require notification. Um, and then any other services, feel free. Um, we can, there are, it's on the slide deck as well, but you can look on um, our website and you can always reach out to a PR rep. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Pam, let's go to you next. Sure. Um, a lot of this is similar information to what was just shared. Um, one thing I will say is when you um, are faxing over an authorization request or emailing it to us, um, it, the form itself doesn't ask for it, it, but I would really recommend putting your NPI number on there, just write it on there, because um, some, some of your groups will have uh, specific services and you're billing under a, a different NPI. And so we wanna make sure that we get the right service type um, on that authorization. So I think that that would really be helpful. Um, and the other thing is to let us know if you're out of network. Um, perhaps your contract doesn't address all programs or all services. So if you are out of network, um, that would be important for us to know. Um, and that would require you know, an out of network authorization um, or, um, I'm sorry, letter of agreement on that. So, um, so just so those are a couple of important things. And then um, I did provide on that one slide the uh, specific email and faxes where you can send those authorization requests. Excellent, thank you. And Mary. Hi. So um, regarding uh, out of network uh, authorizations, I'll just make a note that we have a form on our website. Uh, that can be used uh, for that particular service. And there's information on that form on where to send um, the information in. And so um, I, I, we, I hadn't mentioned that earlier, so I wanted to point that out. Um, 
a lot of the information that was shared by other plans, I think, applies to our plan as well. But I wanted to take the opportunity to introduce um, another member of our team, Allison West. She's our behavioral health program manager, and she's not displaying on the panel today, but she is attending today. So I think we'll give Allison um, a, a couple of minutes to talk about notifications and authorizations and issues that are um, uh, important for her team. Hey, everybody, can you hear me okay? Yes. yes. This is Allison West. I'm the manager of behavioral health services for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Western New York, better known as Amerigroup. Um, so I help oversee the case management and utilization management programs. And, you know, I think the most common questions that I'll highlight here that we get from providers um, are surrounding, you know, notification and authorization of CFTSS services and um, HCBS uh, services for children. And I think when the Children's Transformation Project first kicked off, we were trying to look at how to make things easy on you as the provider, right? Because this is a huge transition, a huge change that we're asking you to make coming over to manage care plans. So, um, you know, when we're meeting, trying to put things in place as part of the transition, we just kind of took off that notification process for CFTSS services and had um, really taken a look at them as just an outpatient service that you could bill, like you typically would bill as an in-network provider. So, for those services, we do not require notification and authorization for those services, um, and you would just bill at, like you typically would bill an outpatient service. I think that tr transition made things a lot easier on providers. I hope so. It, certainly, if it didn't, you should let us know uh, and contact Mary for anything um, that's not working. But I did know um, that uh, the common theme was those modifiers. I think that's where things got a little bit difficult in billing um, those outpatient services, knowing what modifiers to add on to that outpatient service. So if you're still having trouble, certainly contact us. Mary and I love to meet with providers and anybody who's having trouble to walk through some of the steps to make things easier. Um, as far as home and community-based authorizations, uh, we do require authorizations for home and community-based services for children. Um, Amerigroup at this time does not um, have a HARP product, so we don't have um, authorizations in place yet um, for home and community-based services for adults. So really just looking at the home and community-based services for children, we again tried to make the transition really easy. So um, most of the providers in the area and health home case managers in the area know that we have a child-specific team um, with our Western New York health plan. Um, that's made things a lot easier. So yes, is the traditional way you can fax in your request for an authorization and notification, or you can contact the child specific. We only have one child specific case manager who also will help you process your authorizations for home and community based services. So it's really like a full system approach because our case manager who is specific to the children's um, carbon is managing all the children for the Western New York plan. She's in contact with all of the health home case managers, collecting the plans of care to run them up against the request of the service that needs to be authorized. And we, we do that within like a 24 hour turnaround time. So um, that's what we aim to do. It, and it, those services do require authorization. Um, anything outside of those services, I, I kind of focused on those two because we get those questions, I think most often. Um, but anything else, we're kind of following the, the same state plan, any of the OASIS services or substance abuse services that require um, notification, it's just notification. We are not reviewing for medical necessity. We're really building an authorization to put in place for claim payment. So we use those terms interchangeably and I really want to um, point out when we're talking about a notification only from a provider, it's just to say, hey, heads up, we have this higher level of care service that we're putting in place that we'll need a concurrent review or for you to monitor, you know, past this initial phase um, and, you know, to collect some of the information that we might need to follow the, the member um, throughout the process uh, for whatever the service may be. So that's just one example. And again, you can always ask Mary, myself, 
um, or any of our clinical team if you have any of those questions um, about authorization versus notification versus just regular claim payment and billing. So hopefully that, that helps. <laughs> yes, thank you. I appreciate that. And next, uh, in regards to authorization notification, uh, Heidi? Sure. So I think one of the most important pieces is making sure that that authorization or notification matches what you're billing for. So if you're authorized for something and you see that maybe you, you need more, you're going beyond those units or you're, you know, extending the time frame or whatnot, you really want to make sure you reach out sooner rather than later to get that authorization updated. Um, because if it's not, that's when you'll see those no authorization denials. If you're not sure for services that require authorization, you can check out Provider Express. Um, you can reach out to your network manager, and we're happy to assist you with that. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. So our next and third uh, final kind of common uh, question that we get, and then we'll turn to the questions we'll be getting. And again, thank you folks for chatting uh, questions in. We do get a, a lot of questions around appeals process. Um, and I know some of you during your opening presentation did talk about um, the appeal process as well. So just wanted to, you know, give folks another opportunity to, you know, maybe briefly mention, because again, I think uh, you guys already talked a little bit about that, um, the appeals process. So I'll turn this to Pam at Fidelis to, to kick us off with that discussion. Okay. Um, yes, if a provider, um, if you disagree with the claim denial or the payment, um, you should uh, attach documentation supporting the payment along with, the, if we have a claim appeal form, and that's found in Section 13A of our provider manual, um, and that needs to be done within 60 days of the remittance advice. Um, if you um, have a, a payment, it's an overpayment, um, and we agree that we overpaid that, um, please know that the overpayment will be withdrawn from a future payment. Uh, please don't send us a check for that, okay? Um, and then on that appeal form, um, there's a mailing address where you can mail the appeal form um, to. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, let's move to, to Mary in regards to the appeals process. Sure. So uh, we encourage you to file your appeals electronically. So on our website, uh, we have rolled out um, uh, a tool. We've had it um, for, I think, at least maybe a year, maybe a year and a half, where you can bring up the claim and then um, just like right down on the lower right-hand side, you click Appeal. If you have documentation, you can upload that documentation. Um, and then you can track the status of that appeal online as well. And the option, other option is to mail it in. Uh, but you won't have that ability to track as closely, I think. Um, so, um, I, you know, we encourage you to file electronically. And, um, you know, if you have any questions, you can always reach out. So, thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Heidi? Hi, yeah. So, for United, I touched on it in um, the slides. But for us, you would need to mail your appeal in um, within 60 days of the provider remittance advice. And that's how we would accept the appeals and process them that way. Thanks. Thank you. And Sarah? Okay, awesome. So uh, for Excellus, you can always contact our customer care department. Uh, and that information for the phone number is located on the slide deck. Or you can outreach to your behavioral health provider relations rep. You have questions um, regarding the appeal process or if you have a, a claim that you would like to appeal. Thank Great. you. Thank you. And Cheryl? Sure. For New York Medicaid, uh, please submit the member's medical record along with a cover letter advising the exact services and the dates of service that you are appealing. You must submit the appeal request within 60 calendar days of the initial adverse determination or the initial explanation of payment. As long as all requested information is received, the Beacon Review Provider will render a decision and a letter is sent to both the member and the provider within 30 calendar days of receipt of the appeal. There is one level of internal appeal. If the appeal is upheld, the determination letter will include information on how to submit an external appeal and the time frame for doing so. 
That's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. So uh, I think we're going to turn our attention now towards uh, a number of uh, questions we got. And again, folks, we'll try to get to as many as possible. And thank you for all the questions that are coming in. We got a number of questions on coordination of benefit and kind of secondary claims in the process uh, as it relates to uh, billing and especially what's might be acceptable electronically if they're billing your plan secondary, what needs to be built on paper. Um, so this this part of the presentation sometimes is a little tricky because we don't have an order. And so hopefully uh, this will work out. But anybody wants to start with just giving a very brief comment about coordination of benefit, any uh, tips or any uh, suggestions you can give to providers or your plans process to it? Boris, this is Sarah. I can take this one. So okay. um, if you have a, a claim that you are submitting and um, maybe we'll take, for example, the individual has um, Medicaid managed care through Excellus and they have um, a commercial policy or primary policy through somewhere else, um, you can always um, reach out for just kind of the identification of, of how that would go. But we would want um, an EOB just identifying that you did bill the primary um, insurance first. If you are having uh, difficulty, again, I encourage you to reach out because we can help assist with that process. Um, so always feel, feel free to reach out if you do have questions. Excellent, thank you. Others? Okay, Joe. Sure. So with Beacon, um, what we have noticed is that um, oftentimes a member will have a Medicare plan as primary and a Medicaid plan as secondary. Um, they may not both be with uh, Beacon. Um, some of the issues arise when a service is covered by one of the plans but not the other, but you still need the denial in order to submit to that second plan. So, for example, with Medicare, uh, a 99051 for after hours may not be covered in the Medicare plan, but you need that denial in order to submit to the Medicaid plan. Um, so, just make sure once you do get that denial from the Medicare plan that you are submitting that denial as part of your submission uh, to the Medicare plan. Uh, don't forget to include that uh, primary EOB. Okay, thank you. So this is Mary. I'm going to um, um, kind of kitty from what Cheryl was talking about, and that is on providers that I've been working with um, specifically recently who have uh, primary Medicare. However, the service that was provided was provided by a um, individual who's not enrollable by Medicare. And so uh, for our plan, um, you know, we're going to follow the Medicaid zero fill policy and that can be a tricky one, I think. Um, so if you're having some issues uh, with um, getting a claim paid um, with a Medicare primary for um, a non enrollable Medicare provider, make sure you reach out and contact me. We encourage you to appeal uh, in a, through our online appeal process. But if you're having issues with that, um, you know, I'm more than happy to, to assist um, you work through that appeal process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and this is Pam. Um, for Fidelis, it would be the same. Um, what Mary just stated, same process. Um, you know, the zero fill uh, for those for those practitioners that aren't enrollable in Medicare. And um, as far as the EOB, um, you have to mail that in. Um, I know sometimes that's been a source of frustration for providers, but secondary claims, hopefully um, someday soon we will get there where we can accept those electronically, but right now um, we have to mail those in. Okay, thank you. And for United, we do accept um, the secondary via electronic submission, so that can be um, submitted via paper or electronic. Great, thank you. And we, we got a question before, actually, uh, before the, the presentation somebody submitted as, uh, I guess it's somebody who is uh, is out of network uh, or is maybe looking to contract. And it was really specific to uh, single case agreements. So I know in, in my experience, you know, for a provider to get paid, they have to have some sort of an agreement, right? I think sometimes there's a misconception that I can just build a plan and get paid. Um, 
And that is true if you have a full contract and credential with the plan, or if you have a single case agreement, but there needs to be something in place. And I you know in some instances a single case agreement makes sense. And so can you know in my experience, actually they're pretty straightforward and simple, meaning they're not that extensive, long document. They're usually, you know, maybe a couple of pages a little bit more long um and and goes through pretty quickly so i don't know if anybody would like to you know talk anything about kind of a single case agreement or am i getting that right or has the process changed over time of course this is mary with blue cross well so I'll, I'll just sort of start the discussion off there um yeah it's 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 an important process but i think that uh, from a plan perspective um if the member is in need of emergency care we do not want to delay in emergency admission. And so, um, you know, make sure that as an organization, well, these are outpatient providers we're talking about, but if you're also providing inpatient um, um, and you happen to be out of network and on the call today, um, don't delay. Yeah, right. Uh, but you never know. So don't delay. Uh, make sure that that uh, member is admitted. Um, and then we have a process, our team, um, Allison and our team work very closely together, um, that if there is um, a need for a single case agreement, it is a very short document. Um, we try to facilitate those and get those, um, you know, the logistics through that very quickly to make sure that there's no delay uh, to the provider. So, um, and I'm sure others um, plans will add some additional information, but I think that, um, you know, we're all, we all do the single case agreement process and I'm sure it's fairly similar. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. I can take that for United too. We also do the single case agreement. Um, you know, when you're out of network, you'll want to get that. Another important piece to remember is that you're, if you're currently going through credentialing and you haven't been contracted yet, make sure you're getting the single case agreement during that time frame as well until you're contracted with us. Okay. Hey, Cheryl. I'm sure. And for Beacon, uh, pretty much the same as the others for single case agreements. You know, keep in mind if you are an out of network provider and it's, you know, a, a routine therapy, et cetera, um, to be considered for a single case agreement, there would have to be no one in the area who can render the same service uh, who is already in network. Um, but most of the time, what happens is um, a new service is coming in, um, say, you know, volunteer foster care agency or uh, one of the child ser children services, et cetera, CFTSS. Maybe we are in the process of contracting with you, but you're not quite finished yet, not through the credentialing process. You want to make sure that you are uh, you have a single case agreement on file before treating any of those uh, patients on our plans that uh, you would be considered out of network at that moment. Excellent, thank you. Um, for Fidelis, the process is very much the same as uh, you all have mentioned. The other plans have mentioned. Um, I. One thing I want to mention also is if you are not in the network and would like to be on our website, there is a link um, you can go to and um, fill out a form to uh, enroll in our you know, in participation with Fidelis, and that goes to our contract management department, um, and they will make a determination and reach out. Great. Thank you. Sarah, anything on your end? Yeah, so for Excellus, um, like you mentioned, Boris, the process is, is very Quick, uh, we want to make sure that we can get the individual um, engaged with those services. Um, so a provider can contact our medical intake um, line, and through that, through fax and um, phone, they can get the single case agreement uh, started. And just as the other health plans have said, we do encourage um, providers who are within our network, um, if they're not yet contracted with us, to um, engage in contracting. All right. Thank you. So another question. Um, it's less about denials, but more about uh, uh, bill processing. So a question came in in regards to if a provider submitted a claim and got paid, but then noticed that maybe there was something wrong with the original claim, meaning maybe the diagnosis was incorrect or even date of service or anything else on that claim that they might have noticed after the fact and specifically after getting paid. Uh, was, um, you know, that they would like to update. Is there a, a process or something you can recommend? How would a provider go about making those changes 
Um, I know this might be a little on the more difficult or extensive side uh, of an answer, uh, but uh, any you know quick thoughts or suggestions? Sure. So um, I think probably most of us will say the same thing, but you can submit a corrected claim. So we would reprocess those services and the difference in the amount, whether you know we owed you more, then you'd just get that additional payment. Or, but if the service was for less, then we would show you that there was an overpayment out there. Gotcha. And if not, if it was equal, then nothing then happens. Then it would be I the say. same. Yeah. Like if it was just yeah. a diagnosis change or whatnot, but if it was a service change and, you know, it was a rate difference, then we would reflect that in the reprocessing. And you just want to make sure you put that seven um, as your billing code showing that it's a corrected claim. Got it. Thank you, Heidi. Anybody has a different process or anything to add? Yeah. Sarah from McKellis. So, um, similar to Heidi, you can always submit a corrected claim if you'd like. Also on our website, we have an area where you can send in um, claim adjustments online. So it's a really easy process. Um, so again, always feel free to reach out if you do have questions. Got it. Cheryl, I think you wanted to jump in. Sure. So there's a couple of different scenarios with Beacon. Uh, one is a little bit more difficult than the other. Um, but if it is a simple, you know, one for one uh, correction, that's fine. Just submit the correction with the uh, bill type ending in seven and the original claim number. Um, some of the difficulty that we see at Beacon um, is when claims are not billed according to the 599 billing guidelines that all services for the same day, same provider, um, same rate code need to be billed on the same claim form. Um, and in those situations, um, an example being where a provider's coming in, I'm sorry, a member is coming into a clinic and they see a physician for a 99213 and then they go down the hall and they see a LCSW for a 90834. Um, the LCSW may finish her notes, um, you know, a day, the same day or uh, right away and then the physician wouldn't finish her notes until, you know, two or three days later. So those services are billed on two separate claim forms. The 90834, of course, we receive first, and that would pay out with no problem. And then we receive a 99213 all by itself on another claim. Now that claim would uh, deny because both services need to be billed on the same claim. So you basically have to delete the first claim or avoid the first claim and then read both services on, on a new claim so that they both pay as an original service. So it gets a little bit complicated there. And if anybody has any questions or concerns um, about that process, uh, always keep the lines of communication open with us and we'd be happy to help you uh, understand how that process works. Good. Others before we move on to the next question? Of course, this is Mary. I think I'll just add uh, one other comment. And, and that is um, refer to your explanation of payment, your EOP. And uh, what that document will have on there is the history. So it will have the original um, and then it'll have your corrected claim. So you can verify that that correction has gone through. So um, it's an important document. I know they're not always the friendliest to read our lovely EOPs. Um, however, they they do have that history there for you so you can track that along. Um, and um, again, you know, it sounds like we're similar to other plans, but um, make sure that you have that um, in the bill type, that third digit seven for the corrected claim. Because if you don't put that in, um, your claim um, is, well, you're gonna have two claims on file then, uh, with um, you know the same information or slightly different information, and that just makes it a, a you know a trickier kind of correction to have to work through. So um, use the seven. Um, so thank you. Great, thank you, Pam. Um, I would like to add that you know it, it's the, a corrected claim is required within 60 days of the remittance advice, but there are times and extenuating circumstances when it's beyond that. So communication is key. If you could reach out to us and let us know, um, perhaps during COVID you were closed down or you had staffing issues, there are extenuating circumstances. And the way that we deal with those at Fidelis is we go through, a, a, we call it a reconsideration process, which is 
basically a fancy way to say it's a project, a claims project. Um, but we would need that explanation. Um, we would need the universe of claims. I'm not saying we would go back years, um, but you know, certainly um, would give it reconsideration. Um, that goes, once we gather all that information, that goes to our senior management team and they make the determination on that. But again, if you're if you're having any circumstances like that, please reach out and let us know um, sooner rather than later uh, what's happening. All right. So one message that I think I'll keep hearing is communication. If I got it, if right, make sure that you communicate with your plans. So I want to also turn to Yvette, who I know been monitoring the the chat box here and see if there is any uh, questions, uh, Yvette, that you have noticed that you want to uh, bring up to the panelists. Yeah, so there, there is a question, it's like a technical question around um, a payer ID code. So the question is, for instances where one or more MCOs have merged together, um, should they be, should billing be processed using the same payer ID code? So, and, and they give the example of a Fidelis and like WellCare. So um, just any guidance you can give around that. So I guess it's probably not applicable to everybody here, but you know, maybe for some folks. Yeah, for Fidelis, you would use that same payer ID. It's one one three one five, same payer ID code. All right. I think that might be it, right, from the panelists in regards to that. All right. Thank you. Um, there was also a question about. Re I know we always get this referring provider question. In regards, if you require it, and if you do require it, um, you know, is there particular circumstances? Is it always required? I mean, this was in particular to, I think, L LMSWs, but I think I'm going to make it more general. Do folks require that providers uh, indicate a referring provider's NPI number when submitting a claim? At United, we do not. Okay, for any circumstance, I guess, right? for outpatient. Okay, thank you. Others? Same with me again. Same with Blue Cross. Same with Fidelis. Okay. Fidelis does not require that. Okay. And Sarah, on your end, is that required or not required? Not required. Got it. All right, thank you. All right, um, I think we have, we have maybe Time for a couple of more questions. Um, Yvette, any other questions that are jumping out? I'm just kind of quickly looking myself. I think we. Oh, also, from our uh, panelists, please feel free to jump in if you have things that you wanted to add. Um, Boris, this is Cheryl from Beacon. Um, there is the one question uh, asking if any of the uh, payers could discuss cost share waivers for New York State Medicaid for behavioral health services, and is that still in effect? So technically, Medicaid doesn't usually have a cost share. Um, members are not expected to uh, pay a copay or a deductible. So for Medicaid specifically, that would not be applicable. Um, but for other plans that do require a cost share, uh, yes, that is still in effect for uh, both telehealth services and for uh, telehealth as well as inpatient, I'm sorry, in-person services for essential workers. Excellent. Thank you. That, that's You're correct. Welcome. Yeah. Yeah, since we do focus on Medicaid co-sharing, um, it's not an issue here. It's not required, but thank you for that. We do we do have a question in regards to some of the required fields and not required. So, um, in our billing tool at MCTAC, you know, we work with all of the plans and we indicate, you know, if a field is required, sometimes it's required by one plan, but not another plan, or if there again the coordination of benefits. And I guess the question is, if for a particular plan a field is not required but is completed right by a provider either because in the coordination of benefit the other plan required it or the provider just completed does that will that cause a denial if something is put in that you guys in your particular plan might not necessarily be looking at like i guess a referring provider if somebody still puts an npi number there would that uh, generate uh, a denial for Beacon, no. Okay. Uh, for Fidelis, I have not seen that happen. Okay. For Excellus, it would not deny. 
For United, that'd be the same on the UB. And the same with Blue Cross. Excellent. I really like those so simple answers. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. Uh, again, Yvette, anything else um, coming up that we can, because uh, I just want to be mindful of time, especially since it's almost five o'clock and uh, and majority of the people are still with us. So that's really good. Yeah, I don't see any other questions for us that you did not pose or did not get um, right. answered. Mm -hmm. I, I know I got a, a question in, and again, I think just I wanted to underscore the importance of communication. And I know it, you know, some of the providers might be rolling their eyes, but you know, one of the, I mean, it wasn't really a question, a comment was, you know, sometimes providers get denials and one, they're not sure why they even got a denial. Uh, or when they look at the reason code, it seems like what they submitted is all accurate. Um, you know, and I know we talk about different ways the providers could, you know, um, you know make changes or update their systems to, you know, get to the to the clean claim right uh, process. But you know, the same as goes with providers who you know run into technology issues or or system issues. Plans have system issues as well. And I think, you know, the comment was, you know, we get a lot of denials and we spend a lot of time trying to figure them out. And a lot of times we don't know what the issue is or there is no issue, but we still get denials. So I know what I tell providers is one is you might not one recognize that there is an issue and there is an issue or two is maybe a plan is having an issue with either your setup in their system or what's happening in their particular that time or something happened. And so my, I get, you know, reference to that and coming back to that has always been call the plan, right? Get in touch with the plan, set up a time to talk. And maybe you do have to go through a process where, you know, the plan has to recognize that maybe something is going on in their system. Uh, sometimes it's system wide or sometimes it's only pertains to you, right? Because maybe there's some setup issue that happened or something went wrong with your billing per se, right? And so I just wanted, because, uh, you know, th that was a, a comment I got, and I think it's important to, you know, again, emphasize that there's no magic there, right? Sometimes there is magic, use seven instead of one, right? Or make sure your modifiers match to your CPT codes and all these things that we talked about. But sometimes it's just, you know, reach out to your, your plan representative to have this discussion to kind of discover further. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're actually having these panel series and all of this contact information available to continue encouraging that. So I don't know in a few minutes if we have left, if there's any other magical ways you guys know and would like to share for providers to, um, you know, kind of solve some of these, you know, um, uh, denial issues or, or issues. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. Um, it's really important that providers reach out. Um, I think that there are times where we discover through a provider that something is wrong. And so we'll take a look at that, run reports, review, look for that denial reason. We can even run reports across the network um, and, you know, work through to see what the issue is. You're right, things do break and we'd like to try to make the process of fixing that, um, we like to fix as quickly as possible, but then make the adjustment process for providers as painless as possible. Um, you know, our plan can run a report and submit an adjustment on behalf for the provider. Um, and so, you know, it's something we just take it, it's fixed now, and we're going to have your claims adjusted, communicate with the provider all along during that process to make sure that they're aware that that's happening. Um, it, it, you know, it's unfortunate, it is difficult, but things happen. And so especially like during a benefit carve in, we really wanna know if something you're seeing is a little off because you, know, you spend time testing claims, but that doesn't mean you're gonna see everything. And so um, communication is key. Um, and we you know, really wanna work with you. Um, as I'm sure the other plans do too. So we appreciate your, you know, all the time that you do spend 
um, reviewing things and looking for patterns and seeing things that are off. So, Thank you. Yep. Others? I suspect uh, that represents for most of you. Go ahead, Cheryl. Yeah, and for Beacon, again, um, to your point, Boris, it's so important to keep the lines of communication open. Um, please just remember that there is a difference between a rejection and a denial. A rejection didn't get to us. It, it, didn't, it rejected in the clearinghouse somehow before it got to our front door. Um, a denial would be there, there's something incorrect on the claim form. Where, you know, it's a provider billing error or we don't have the file set up correctly. But if you're getting the same rejections or the same denials week over week or even month over month, Please contact us. We do our very, very best to contact you first. Um, but if you're seeing any sort of a pattern or a trend, please get in touch with us so we can get on that as quickly as possible. The key is communication. Keep those lines of communication open with us at all times. Excellent. Thank you. So I, I just want to, in, in a few minutes that we have left, I just want to say thank you to the panelists for participating and um you know taking on these questions and also to all the attendees and for all the questions again just want to say you know we will be posting uh, the slides and the recording as this was our last panel discussion and so hopefully by the end of the week we'll be able to post everything and again just want to say thank you to everybody and just wanted to wish everybody a great evening and rest of the day thank you everybody take care thank you bye thank you bye-bye